next guest has sort of outlined a plan that she thinks might work uh, to get us there a little bit quicker. We're joined now by Dr. Jennifer Kwan. Good morning, doctor. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. How are you guys? Good. So you sort of put together a, a, a plan that you think could get us back to quote unquote normal, whatever that's going to be, within three to six months, right? Yes, and definitely it will not be our normal that we're used to. Yeah. Uh, that will not happen until a vaccine or a vaccine treatment is found. However, I think there is a way that we can get back to normal within three to six months. Okay, so, so that's, I, I, that's hopeful. As you said, yeah, I know it's a, I know it's very frustrating to hear vaccine may take uh, 18 months to develop. Yeah. Like, you know, we've already had a month of isolation. How much longer can we do, right? Exactly. Um, I know that uh, Canadians are feeling frustrated because anytime there is implementation of social distancing measures, there is a lag time for the numbers, right, to take effect. Yeah, you don't so, see it immediately. We're all we're always we're looking in the rearview mirror a bit when it comes to the numbers. It's sort of what we did a week or two ago is what we're seeing reflected in the numbers now. Exactly. So right now the numbers um, reflect those of maybe about two three weeks ago. So and as uh, we progress through this uh, isolation period, our uh, scientists and leaders are also learning more. So mm -hmm. one of the things we've learned is that. Um, the importance of um, testing, so easy, rapid, widespread testing to enable us to isolate cases, trace contacts, and identify uh, small outbreaks before they recur. And the other thing we've learned recently, um, well, for some, they may have known before others, but uh, the effectiveness of masks for the general public yes. in reducing transmission. Right. And there are, I mean, okay, there have been conflicting studies since the beginning of this about the effectiveness of masks. So let's kind of unpack that a little bit and, and talk about why they are effective and why we should be using them. Exactly. So for um, masks, there's really two major categories. One is the medical mask, so surgical mask N95. Those are best used in a healthcare setting right now for healthcare workers because health care workers are working front lines with uh, COVID positive patients are at high risk for exposure. Um, even if they're not working with COVID patients, uh, we must consider all patients um, and other staff to potentially have the virus in order to prevent asymptomatic transmission. What that means is um, if you don't have any symptoms of the virus or even maybe in the period before you get uh, symptoms, you may be contagious. So we have to um, encourage uh, universal masking in medical settings and hospitals in order to uh, prevent that. So for the general public, uh, there has been many great initiatives for homemade or cloth masks. These are very effective on a population basis. What that means is if everybody is wearing a cloth or homemade mask because it's catching the droplets around your own face, it can protect other people uh, from you or each other if someone has the virus and either has minimum symptoms or doesn't know yet. So it's, uh, it works to protect each other uh, from uh, the virus. So it's, have you heard the saying like, your mask protects me and my mask protects you? Mm -hmm, That's kind mm -hmm. of the uh, understanding of that. So would you agree, Jennifer, with um, masks being something that should be mandatory? I think eventually we will get to that stage, even if it's not mandatory, it will be strongly encouraged. So New York has recently implemented universal masking, uh, I believe as mandatory um, for citizens to kind of control the outbreak. So we may be following other footsteps soon. Now you mentioned testing. Uh, it has to be easy and it has to be fast. Uh, we're a bit mm -hmm. of a ways off from there. but. Um, why is that so important? I mean, I understand that we, we can then identify carriers, but um, you want everybody would have to be tested in that sense, right? Yes. So not maybe not everybody, but uh, as many people as possible, um, we do have to continue expanding our testing capacity. Uh, so right now, um, when we're looking at tests, we are targeting it towards the most uh, high risk or highly affected groups, you know, people who have symptoms, who've had exposure, work in health systems, things like that. However, for many people who have mild cases, they may not be tested, so we may be missing potential um, 
cases in the community. And when you don't tell someone they have it or not, you can advise them to self-isolate. People may not take it seriously. If we don't know they have it, we not, may not be doing contact tracing to figure out where they could have gotten it or you know, if they have passed it on to anyone else. Um, that way we may be missing a large uh, percentage of the cases. So testing is very important um, right now to help us identify where the outbreaks are, but in the future, in order to resume back to normal, we do need to know uh, before someone goes to work, someone goes to major events, if they're contagious, if they have the virus, and whether they can pass it on to other people. And that sort of works hand in hand also with isolating and distancing uh, in terms of people who... um, you know, we, we, they're told to isolate, but um, that's sort of the third component in your plan. We have to make sure that we keep these distancing policies in place for, for a little while longer yet. Exactly. And I think that now we are starting to see the results of our distancing from a few weeks ago, which uh, is kind of encouraging because our numbers are not looking as bad as um, some models and projections are predicting. And as you said, the three components would be distancing, easy testing, and masks. So DEM is how you spell pandemic without panic, DEM. Makes oh, All right. okay. I like that. What yeah. about, what about, okay. So from the perspective of, of just of, of different areas of medicine, um, what about drug shortages? We're hearing now about morphine and propofol being something that are dangerously low and hard to come by. Do you anticipate that that's going to be uh, an issue that will impact other areas of medicine moving forward? Uh, we have heard of reports of potential drug shortages. I think right now there's a few policies in place to kind of prevent that. Initially, some of the shortages may have been people concerned due to drug shortages and filling their prescriptions mm-hmm. early. So, uh, for example, pharmacies have uh, limited the, you know, uh, dispensing. So they're going to give you your medication, maybe give you a month, maybe not give you more than what you normally would have. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure they're keeping a close eye on the stock and ensuring that the supply chains are not interrupted from countries abroad. Okay. Thanks, All Doctor. Right. Doctor, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Enjoy your morning. Yeah, you too. Stay well. That's Dr. Jennifer Kwan, a family physician based in Toronto. So DEM is how you spell pandemic without panic. I like that. Yeah. Distancing, easy testing, yeah. and masks. All right. Makes sense.